Last week, we looked at uh, the consumer side. So we wanted to know how consumers uh, make choices, how they achieve equilibrium. And just to remind you, when we talk about the consumers' equilibrium, we mean the way they use their resources to maximize satisfaction. Okay? So how they do that. We, um, we looked at the budget line. That's what you can as a consumer. That's what you can afford. And the indifference curve as what you want, or what you wish. When you combine these together, then that point where the budget line touch the highest indifference curve, this is the equilibrium point for you as a consumer. And this tells us the combination that will maximize your satisfaction. Okay, and at this point, this uh, point that the uh, the budget line touched the uh, indifference curve, the slope of the indifference curve equal the slope of the budget line. If you remember, the slope of the indifference curve is the marginal rate of substitution. The slope of the budget line is the relative prices. So at this point, so that's what that's the combination we're looking for. Okay, um, today. We will move to the other side. We will move to from consumer side to producer or the firm side. So now, or, or lecture today and and the next lecture, probably next week as well, we will think of um, firms how they achieve equilibrium. So what firms want to do. So now we know what we want to do if we um, as consumers we want to maximize our satisfaction. Why don't we simply buy everything? It's just because we don't have enough resources. That's the problem. And the same problem faces firms as well. Okay? So if you remember the first lecture, we started this module. I said the economic problem faces all economic units. So that includes consumers, firms, countries, household like any any economic units okay so for the first lecture or this lecture we will look at how the economic problem faces a uh, firm just explain this uh, into more more details to do this as i said we'll explain how the economic problem face um, um, firms and we'll distinguish between technological efficiency and economic efficiency when firms use uh, their uh, the resources, they want to make the best or the most of these resources. Remember, resources are limited. So what we're trying to do here as a firm, you can't produce everything. Then you need to think how to make the most of these resources, the resources that is available to you as, as, a, as a firm. So that, since we need to be more efficient, we need to be uh, efficient and that's why we need to understand the difference between uh, technological efficiency and economic efficiency. We'll also learn about the different types of markets because this is the environment in which firms operate. So we'll look at different types of markets and the, at the, the end we'll look at the difference between the short run and the long run. So let's now start with the basic thing about firms. What is a firm? So a firm is just an institution. They hire factors of production. What are these? What are factors of production? You remember from the first lecture? Does anyone remember factors of production? Factors of production, yeah? Yes? Perfect, thank you. So these are the facts of production. So firms hire these facts of production. Again, if you didn't hear him, so land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. So we have four facts of production. As we said, all resources, all factors of production can be under these <coughs> one of these categories. Okay. So firms hire these facts of production, organize them, produce and sell goods and services. So that's what firms uh, do. 
So what is the ultimate goal for, for firms? What they're looking forward to have or to do? Exactly, profit maximization, thank you. So that's what they want to do. So basically, all businesses, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for not just profit, they want to maximize profit, given the resources and any constraint they are subject to, and given the environment they work in, which is the market. That's why we're gonna look at different types of markets today. Okay, and, 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 and study their characteristics, main characteristics, how they look like. So a firm's goal is to maximize profit, not just to make profit. If they fail to do so, then they either just shut down or taken over by another firm that can do that, can maximize profit. Okay? So now we agree, that's what we're looking for. So as firms now, as I, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, now we need to switch from thinking as consumers to think as producers, as a firm, okay? So we're looking for profits. We want to maximize profit. And that's why we need to understand the difference between accounting profits and economic profits. So what is profit? How we calculate profits? Yeah, so the revenue, the total revenue, minus the cost, perfect. So that's what that's how we calculate it. So it's the same with accounting profit and economic profit. The only difference is that the way as we as economists look at the cost or calculate the cost. So we, we still look at total revenue minus total cost, but the way we measure the total cost is a little bit different from the way accountants look at it. So what we do, we look at the opportunity cost of uh, production. Remember, you've got resources. You could have done different things with these resources. When you make a decision, when you make a choice and use these resources to produce some um, product X or Y, then you have actually given up doing something else with these resources. So that's the idea. We look at the uh, best alternative use of these resources. We're not just looking at the resources as the market value, we're looking at the opportunity cost. So the difference between accounting profit and economic profit is that we, we, the way we calculate the cost, the total cost we look at the opportunity cost. And again, the opportunity cost is the value of the best alternative use of these, uh, of these resources. So, <coughs> these resources come from, could be bought in the market, the resources that any firm use, owned by the firm, supplied by the firm's owner. So three different types of, of resources, or three, um, or these resources can come from three different uh, sources, so from the market or owned by the firm or uh, supplied by the firm's owner. So basically, the resources that firms buy from the market, raw material, anything they buy from the market. So there is an opportunity cost. Why? When they make decision to buy this, these resources from the market, where is the opportunity cost here? You see you start <laughs> high and then you just went down with your voice, so I couldn't really hear the rest. Okay. <laughs> Can you say it again? Yes, exactly. So we, when you when you when you spend when you when you um invest in these resources, when you buy these resources. Basically, as you said now, you're giving up something else. So what we given up here, we could have bought something different. We could have bought different resources and make different different goods and services. So we should, so that is the, the idea. So when you make a decision here, as you said, you, you've given up something in, on the, in the same time, in the same time, okay? So whatever you've given up here or the best alternative use of these resources is our opportunity cost. 
Okay, so if using whatever resources you have as a firm, you get the option or you have the choice to produce good A or B. You decided to produce A. So there's an opportunity cost here because you've given up or you didn't produce B. So you could have used these resources to produce something else. So that is the idea of the opportunity cost when you give up something, as you said, uh, for that choice. So that's what about the resources owned by the firm? So if capital owned by the firm, that there's an opportunity cost because this capital can uh, be used or could, could have been used in, in different investment or different project. So what we do as economists, we say there is an Im implicit rent for this capital. We, we know it is owned by the, the company, it is owned by the firm, but still this firm could have rented this capital from somebody else, from another firm, and that's why we, we say there's an implicit uh, rent here, and we consider it that as if the capital or the, 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 the firm rent the capital from itself. So there has to be some, some return, and there's, there's some opportunity cost here. So again, there are different uses of these uh, resources, and we always look at the opportunity cost. So we, we calculate the impl implicit rental uh, rate of capital, and this includes two things. Economic depreciation, because, for example, if you, um, if you have machine, for example, and this machine, uh, after a few years of using this machine, the, the value of this machine is not going to be the same. So it's not going to be as the same value you had it like a few years ago. So when we look at the economic depreciation, we look at the change in the market value of this capital over a given a given period. So this is something we consider as well uh, when we calculate the, the total cost. Just let me take you back to the storage. I don't want you to get lost. We said the main goal of firms, they want to maximize profits. Then we make this distinction between economic and accounting profits. So in, in both cases, we look at the difference between the total revenue and the total cost. So where the difference comes from is the way we calculate uh, the, the total cost. We look at the opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of production is the opportunity cost of using these resources. And these could be, as, as we said, could come from the market or owned by the firm or supplied by the, uh, 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 the, the firm's uh, owner. So now we will look at the, uh, the, the, the resources that's owned by the firm. We, as I said, we consider this as if the firm rented these resources or this, this capital from itself. So there should be an implicit rent. And this cover or should cover the economic depreciation, so the change in the market value of this capital over a given uh, uh, period, and also the foregone interest. So what is the return for capital, you remember, when we talk about the factor of production? So land earns rent, exactly, and then labor earns wages and, and capital interest. So there's an interest here, you actually given up by using this capital into this project. You could have, uh, you could have uh, used this in, or, or, or uh, rent this to another firm and earn interest. So you've given up something here, just going back to your point. So that is the opportunity cost. You've given up this rent. So that when we calculate the total cost, we should consider this, which as we said, we called it the implicit rent. rent. We call it implicit because this is the, the capital is actually owned by the firm, but we consider it that rent, the, the firm rent this uh, capital from itself. So as I said, this is the return on the fund. Uh, in the funds used uh, to acquire this capital. Okay, so this is so now these are the sources uh, from the market, the resources uh, owned by the, the firm, and also resources supplied by the firm's owner. All these three, these should be included when you look at the 
total cost if you want to calculate the economic uh, economic profit so the owner of the firm might supply both entrepreneurship and labor so what is the return for entrepreneurship you said it's, it's profit yes yeah? so this is when, when we say the if if you this is the fourth factor of production so you said land earn rent labor earned wage capital interest entrepreneurship profit so they 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 take the risk of organizing this hiring these factors of production uh, land labor capital together they put them in this in, in production process and they produce uh, 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 goods and services. Okay, so and the return to this, or in return, they earn uh, profits, and the 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 kind of profits they earn is 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 called normal profit. Why is it normal? Because this is a return of something they that's what they provide the the inter entrepreneurship. Okay. Um. <coughs> There's, of course, there's there's a, an opportunity cost here as well. Why? Because they could have worked for a different. I mean, as as a as an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur, or as someone who's managing this, so you could actually work for another firm and and earn wage if you want, or earn uh, some return to the, your skills as uh, an entrepreneur. So the idea here again, we we're looking at an opportunity cost. So there's always opportunity cost. So the idea here, rather, we're not just looking at the total cost uh, uh, in 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 the accounting way or the way accountant would look at it. We look at the opportunity cost for everything. So also, you could work for the for the firm. You're the owner. You own this business, but you manage it or you do. Uh, I don't know. You could have a rest restaurant, for example, using your own car to deliver the uh, orders and so on. So you're not actually paying for this, but it is your car. You're working for this restaurant. So if where is the opportunity cost here? You could have taken an alternative job. You could you could have done the same thing to a different restaurant and earn salary for this. This is the return to labor. Am I right? So that's that's the idea. That's how we would think of this so you need to think also of what you've given up of the the opportunity cost of this choice okay so as i said this is the uh so the owner might supply labor but not take a wage and the opportunity cost here that the owner uh, uh, uh given up uh income that could have uh, he could have earned if he took another job uh, an, an alternative job okay is this clear? So the idea here, just I don't want you to get lost because what we're looking at here again, firms looking for maximizing profits. Profits in economics, we're not looking at accounting profit, we look at economic profits. So the way we calculate economic profit include or is the difference is that when we calculate the cost, we're looking at the opportunity cost. So there are two, two different types of profits here. So the accounting profit, that's very straightforward because you look at the revenue minus the cost, that will give you the profit. But in economics, we do the same. Where economic profit, we do the same. We look at two revenue minus cost. The only difference is the, the way cost is measured. So the cost here is measured by the opportunity cost. And this includes everything we just covered now. So just to not get lost, that is the main point here. So the main point, the economic profit is equal a firm's total revenue minus the total opportunity cost of production. Okay? So that is the main point. So let's just go back to the beginning. What we said in the beginning, we said firms looking for maximizing their profits. Profits now, we know, we know economic profit, how we define it now. Okay? So it's the total revenue minus the opportunity cost of, uh, of production. Okay. Now it comes to decisions. Yes. Yes, went back. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> Okay. So now let's come to the decisions part. What sort of decision a firm need to make? 
Can anyone tell me? Okay, can any firm produce or supply everything, all products? So then they need to make decision. They need to decide what to produce. Okay? Can they produce unlimited quantity of whatever they produce? Exactly. Resources are limited, so they can't. Then they need to they need to think or they need to decide because they want to maximize profit, they need to decide on what to produce and in what quantities then how much we should produce. So what will decide how much we should produce? We're limited by resources we have, but also we want to maximize profit. Okay, so we actually trying to, in, 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 in light or like given what we have, the resources we have, we want to produce the quantity that will maximize our profit and also produce the product that hel will help us to, to do so. So is, then you need to decide on the product itself, so what to produce because you can't produce everything and also in, in what quantities. Then comes the question, there are different methods, different ways to combine these together. What are these? The factors of production. Okay, so the four factors of production. So don't go get bored uh, of this today because I'm going to say it many times. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. So the way we organize these together, okay, are different ways, and you need to decide that at the firm. I'm not asking you to give me an answer, but these are things or decisions that all firms need to consider. And the ultimate goal, that's what they're trying to do, is to maximize profit. So they need to choose that efficient way that will uh, uh, maximize their, their profit. So that's the way to produce. And then how to organize and compensate the managers and workers, how to market and price its products, and then what to produce. As we said, the firm, uh, there's no firm that can produce everything. So then they need to decide what to produce themselves and what to buy from other firms. Resources are limited and you could or you need to decide what you will produce and what you will buy from others. So these are sort of questions or decisions they need to answer, any firm. And then what they want to do, why they need to answer this, because they can't do everything. They can't produce everything. And what is the importance, what the important thing here is that how the answer will maximize the profit. Okay? So we need to keep this in mind. This is what firms or businesses looking for is maximum profit okay so that's that's that that tells you how the economic problem faces faces also firms so it doesn't just face us as individuals or households also um, firms face the economic problem and that's what we said in the first lecture so all economic units face the economic problem okay so, there are different constraints, and uh, as I said, when when we make when we make these choices, we are just not not just limited in in resources. Or resources not just limited. We have more constraints for any firm. So these related to technology. So there are things that we can, and there are things that we can't do. Okay. There are information constraints. No firm knows everything. Okay, especially about the future. You don't know. You you, you can't expect when when you start produce. You don't know how much you'll be able to sell. And there are constraints related to market as well. So we have as as firms, you have three types of constraints. So now we know how you're facing the economic problem. What sort of decisions you want to make or you need to make. What, what questions you need to answer, and then you need to be aware of these of these uh, constraints. Why? Because while facing these constraints, this will have implication in your cost as well, and eventually will affect your 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 profits. Okay, and you want to maximize profits, so this is something you need to to consider. So technology here is any method of producing a good or service. So the way we produce a good or service.
the way we combine these factors of production together to produce a good or service, that is technology. So it's how to do it. So technology, of course, advances over time. So if a firm or if any firm want to uh, produce from uh, uh, produce more to, ma to maximize profit, if they want to produce more, this they need to hire more resources, and they are limited. They have this constraint; they cannot change the technology that at this time. So, this given the technology they have, if they want to produce more, then they want to, they need to hire more resources, and this will have, as I said, implication on their um, on their profits. Also, information constraint. We already talked about this. They don't know. Um, they don't know, or they don't have complete information about either the present or the future. So, as I said, when you start producing, when you start a business, you don't know exactly how how many units you're gonna buy or how much you're gonna you're gonna earn. So you don't know. Okay. So that's something about the future as well. You don't know. So this is part of the information or the incomplete information you have. So you don't have complete information. You don't have uh, information about, uh, or you have limited information about quality and efforts that your workforce will will put, you, consumers' plans, and your competitors as well. So these are also constraints related to information. So you don't have complete information. And this, to face this, again, this has implication in your uh, cost and profit. Finally, the market constraint. Um, as I said, when you start up, you don't know exactly how, whether people are actually gonna like your product or not, whether they're gonna prefer your product or not, what kind of, or how much they'd be willing to pay for your product and, and so on. So these are, again, type of constraints. So we have three types of constraints we talked about now. We have technology constraint, we have, we talked about information constraints and uh, market constraints. So now let's move to the, um, the point of how all technology Sorry. so the point of technology now so as we said you have technology is the method you produce the how to produce a, a product so there are two different uh, uh, two d different type of uh, efficiency so you need to to make the most of your sources of the sources you have so you need to be efficient that's why we're looking at two different types of efficiency. Technological efficiency, which is concerned about the amount of inputs. So it occurs when a firm uses the least amount of inputs to produce a given quantity of output. So if you want to produce 100 units of this, so how many, how much inputs you put in? So we're looking at if this is the least you can put in, so that means it's this way or this me method is technologically efficient, okay? So we're looking at the amount of inputs when we think of technological efficiency. So when we think of economic efficiency, we concern about the cost of these inputs, okay? Not the amount of inputs. So what's the difference here? The difference is that the prices the prices of these inputs will be important now. So we'll, we'll affect the economic efficiency. And I'll show an example now. So again, what we're looking forward to have or what we are concerned about when we look at economic efficiency, we're looking at the cost of the inputs. So if, um, so if, if a firm produces a given quantity of output at the least cost, that's the minimum cost possible, then that is economically efficient okay okay so as I said so the the difference between both as you see is the quantity technological efficiency is concerned about the quantity of inputs while economic efficiency is concerned about the cost of inputs so it's not how many you're gonna how many inputs you're gonna use no it's how much they cannot uh, cost you that's economic efficiency Okay, so it's very, very important to understand these, uh, the difference between these two, technological efficiency and economic uh, efficiency. So if you have an economically efficient production process, it will be also technologically efficient, but it's not the other way around. Okay, 
which means a technologically efficient process might not be economically efficient, and I will show you now. So let me, as I said, the, 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 the difference here, because we do not look at the amount when we, when we think of uh, uh, economic efficiency, we're looking at the cost. So I'll show you how the prices will change the, uh, uh, the method that we can consider economically efficient. So let's look at an example. So the example we have here, we have three methods of producing uh, 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 10 TVs a day. So we have method A, method B, and method C. As you can see, we have different combination between capital and labor. So now let's assume that we have only two factors of production, capital and labor. As you can see, method A, we use In method A, we use one labor and 1,000 capital. So these are the inputs. In method B, you have 10 and 10. In method C, you have 1,001. So what we, if we looking at, if we want to calculate economic, which one, uh, to find out which one is economically efficient, we need to look at the cost. So this is the how much it will cost. The labor is $75 per day. Capital is 250 per day. So if you calculate the cost of labor and cost of capital, and then you sum this together, you get the total cost. Then the minimum cost here come with the, so we could uh, use method B to produce 10 TVs a day. Um, and this will cost us 3,250. And this is the uh, least cost. So that means B here is economically efficient compared to A and C. So let's see now if the prices of uh, labor and capital change. So the difference between this, this example A and example B, so that we still have the same methods, A, B, C, the same, nothing changed. The only thing changed here is the price of labor and the price of capital. So we have now 150 per day, one half, $150 per day, for labor and one dollar per day for capital. Then you see which one is the economically uh, efficient method here? It's A. Why? Because if you compare the total cost here, that is the least one. Okay? So what does this example show us? It shows us how when the prices uh, of these inputs change, this will, af will change, uh, will affect economic efficiency. Okay, the third one, so the third one, again, we change the prices, we change the cost, so again, we have the same three methods, but we change the cost of labor, here is one, $1 per day, the cost of capital is 1,000 uh, per day, and this will make uh, method C more economically efficient. Okay, so now you see how, so we have the same, the same three methods, a, B, C, we didn't change anything. The only thing changed here is the prices of the inputs. So that explains to you how we, or that might explain to you the difference between technological efficiency and economic efficiency. Economic efficiency is not concerned about the cost of inputs, not the amount of inputs, okay? And how the prices of inputs will change the, uh, or will affect economic efficiency, okay? So that is, that is, um, now, we're moving from, so now let's, let, me, let me summarize what we did before we move, uh, move on to the next point. So as we said, we think today as firms, as businesses, not consumers, we want to maximize profit. We learn the difference between accounting profit and uh, economic profit. And then we looked at the types of constraint that face uh, firms. And also we looked at the, uh, uh, what decisions they, they, or what questions they need to answer. To, to make to maximize the profits and also we looked at the difference between technological uh, efficiency and economic efficiency now as I said before the environment in which the uh, firms run also uh, affect their ability to make profits so that's why we look at different types uh, of markets we have four types of markets perfect competition monopolistic competition Oligopoly, I'll explain each one of these now, and monopoly. 
So, perfect competition, we have a very large number of firms, very large number of uh, sell uh, sellers and buyers. So, none of these buyers or sellers has an influence in the price. How this happened? Because you have very large number of firms, okay? You have very large number, many firms and many buyers, and they all work or sell an identical product. This is very uh, rare uh, case because if you think of this, um, just if you can, you're going to buy tea, or there's no brands, it's just you, it's just tea. When you buy fruit, for example, of course with tea you have brands. So I'm just saying, just imagine. That's what we mean by identical product. So there's no no differences at all between like buying from this shop or this shop. There's they, they are the same to you. So these are identical products. That's why they have no power on the price. They can't change the price. They, there's no no restrictions to enter the market. So anyone want to start up a business in this market, they can produce. They can just enter the market. There's no problem. Also, buyers and firms are well informed about the prices and about the product of all firms in the industry. Okay? So, to understand this, let's look at monopolistic competition because monopolistic competition might explain most of or many of the products we have today. So, with monopolistic competition, we still have many uh, firms, many uh, firms and many buyers, but the, only, the difference here or the main difference that distinguishes between perfect competition and monopolistic competition is the product differentiation. So, now we have brands. So when you look at the shelf, when you have like when you look at tea or sugar, you might find like slightly different prices. Why? Because of product differentiation. Because through their marketing plans, through their advertisement, they try to show you they are different. They're not like the others. This tea tastes different from the others. This is like the best tea you can you can have. So it doesn't matter if this is true or not. These differences are true or not. This could be something like illusion, something just in your mind, something I was I was I was able to sell to you by advertising, by the way I am packing this, whatever the way I did, by having a nice pack or branding or whatever. So the reason is here. That's why I can have some sort of effect or influence on the price. It's not massive because still, if one of type of tea like they doubt very very expensive probably you can just you, you go to another one so you buy a different one so the idea here is that the difference or the main difference between perfect competition and monopolistic competition comes from uh, 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 the differentiation or product differentiation remember with uh, uh, perfect competition they all deal or sell identical products so there's no way to to know who actually produced this or there's no you don't have any preferences you just you don't mind any of these products, but with differentiated products, uh, you might be convinced somehow that there's some uh, there are some differences, and these differences could be real or not. This is not the the point. This doesn't matter. The only pro the only important thing here is that you believe they are different, and they try to uh, enforce this. So that's why they have some power on. On the price, as I say, and there's no restriction, so they actually share this with uh, perfect competition. So again, any uh, firm can join the market. So you see, we have large number of uh, 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 firms and sellers, uh, sellers and buyers. In in perfect competition, in monopolistic competition, we have the same, but the difference coming from here identical product and identical products with uh, perfect competition differentiated or there's product differentiation with uh, monopolistic competition but when we move to oligopoly you will see we have a small number of firms okay and they might produce identical products or differentiated products so this is not the point so they, they we don't have many firms we have small number of firms in this market and of course since we have few firms then they 
uh, they put barriers to enter this market or there are barriers to enter this this market many again so perfect competition many buyers uh, many sellers many buyers uh, monopolistic competition we have the same so the difference come from the the nature of the product they deal uh, uh, on and then we move to a logopoly where we have few number of, of, of sellers with monopoly we have exactly one 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 firm so with monopoly we have one one firm so we move from competition like the perfect or the ideal case when we have very large number of sellers firms selling identical products to one firm in monopoly one firm sell this product and of course they control the entire output of the industry okay that's why they are monopolists and there are no close substitutes for this product of course what about barriers of course they put barriers yeah they don't want anyone to share these profits with them so they don't want anyone any other firm to enter the market okay so these are the uh, what we have here again so the types of uh, different types of markets we have uh, perfect competition monopolistic competition oligopoly and and monopoly <coughs> so how would we uh, know how do we know uh, which type of market we have or how much competition we have in a market there are different ways to do this that are we, we call measures of concentration so we could use one of these the four firm concentration ratio or the herfindel hirschman index hhi and these are very simple so the first one the four firm concentration ratio is very straightforward because you look at the percentage of the total industry sales accounted for by the four largest firm in the industry so you look at the four largest the biggest uh, four companies in the industry and see how much they produce okay the herfindel hirschman index it does something similar but look at the square of percentage market share of each firm summed over the uh, the largest 50 50 firms so the idea is not just how to calculate it's just the idea of you looking at the concentration so uh, of course you should you should know how to calculate it it's very straightforward it's very easy to do but the idea here is that using these how would we uh, know uh, how do we know whether uh, we have competition or not so uh, as market concentration increases the amount of competition in the industry decreases so remember if you have this like a line now so at one 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 end we have perfect competition with very large number of uh, sellers and on the other side, the opposite side, we have monopoly with one, one, one firm. Okay. So the concentration measures, these measures of concentration can tell you where you are on this line. So are you more toward competition or monopoly? Okay. So as I said, as the market concentration increases, the amount of competition in the industry decreases. So you move toward monopoly. Okay. The decision frame, I'm gonna finish with this one. Uh, when firms make decisions, they have, of course, they keep in mind, that that's what they're looking for. Again, that's the, their objective, that their goal is to maximize uh, profit. And the, there are different type of decision they can make. I just let's, so we, we, we distinguish between the short run and the long run. So there are decisions that you make, you can make in the short run, and you can't make and the sh there are some sort of decision you can't make in the short run so how we, how we how we make this distinction how we distinguish between the short run and the long run so for a firm if there are some inputs that they can't change then they they are on the short run so there are, let's, let me give you an example so in the short run a firm cannot build a new production line cannot build a new plant cannot change capital but they can hire more workers so you see we have some some inputs that are variable that you can change easily in the short run but in the short run you can't there are other variables uh, sorry other inputs that you can't change they are fixed so the amount of capital you have 
as I said, traction line, uh, machines you bought, and, and so on. So there are some decisions that you can't do in, in, in the short run. Okay, so in the short run, I can I can hire more one more worker. I can fire one one worker, so it's, it's fine. So I can make this decision in the short run. But in the short run, there are some decisions that I can't make. There are things that I can't change. Okay, and that's how we make this uh, uh, like the difference between the short run and, and and the long run. So as I said, this so the short run is a time frame in which the quantity of one or more resources used in the production is fixed. So we have capital is fixed in the short run. We can't change capital in the short run. But we can change labor. So this is a variable uh, input in the short run. So I can't change it. But capital is fixed in the short run. So in the short run, technology, you can't change technology in the short run. So there are some uh, some decisions that you can't make in, in the short run. So if all inputs are variable, so you can't change them, then we move to the long run. Okay, so, sorry. So if you if you can change everything, if you can change all, all inputs, then we are in the long run. So again, just before we we finish this lecture, it's very important to to understand this uh, uh, this difference between the short run and the long run. And by the way, that was the first question in the exam last year. <laughs> the difference between the, the short run and the long run. Okay. I'm talking about the firm, for a firm. So the difference between the short run and the long run. It's very important to understand this because wh whatever we're going to say in the next lecture and the next week will depend on your understanding of this. Short run and long run. So in the short run, we have some variables, <laughs> some inputs are variable and some others are fixed. So there are some fixed uh, inputs that we can't change. In general, these are just like capital. In the long run, you can change, you, you should be able to change all, all inputs, capital and labor. Okay? The last thing uh, we're going to look at is the sunk cost. Sunk cost is the cost, a cost incurred by the firm um, and cannot be changed. If, as an example, if a firm's plant has no resale uh, uh, value, then the amount paid for, uh, for, for this is a sunk cost. So let me just summarize, and then I'll conclude for this lecture. So what we looked at today is the way we organize production. We looked at what firms looking for. They be looking for uh, maximizing profit, and they we we looked at the difference between accounting profit and economic profit, and then we look at what type of decisions they want to to make, or they need what type of uh, what questions they need to answer. And then we look at the differences between technological efficiency and economic efficiency. And then we look at different types of markets and then the difference between the short run and the long run. Okay? Any question? <laughs>